So this lecture is about what I'm calling directionality. And I alluded to it earlier saying, what if we're asking more specific questions? And the way we like to phrase that is that what if we add direction to our question? Um, if we had a question like this and we had this big blue distribution and we had these two rare tails, we say that that's two tailed, which you can kind of see why we call it two tailed, right? Because it looks like two red tails. This is a very general question. I just want to know if someone is different from the blue distribution. They could be different because they're much higher or they could be different because they're much lower. We could say that, or we may have a more specific question, what we call one-tailed. A one-tailed question would be that we have some kind of justification to look just on one end. Now, one-tailed distributions should be done very cautiously. You shouldn't just do them because they're convenient. But let's say you're trying to cure childhood cancer and this cancer drug has worked for every adult and every kind of scenario and now you're trying to see if it works for five-year-olds. If you're trying to cure childhood cancer and this been demonstrated to make people live longer, you might be able to be justified in making it a one-tailed test. In that case, you would get rid of that lower tail part of your question because you're not really expecting the kids to go up to live less long if they get your tra cancer treatment. And then you would take that 5% kind of abnormal zone and add it all to one tail. So the thing that is key to remember is that your alpha, which is our kind of that red zone of abnormality, always remains 5%. So it's either split evenly on either side, 2.5% on the left and 2.5% on the right, or it's totally put on one side. You can make it upper tailed or you could make it lower tailed. So in my little story about curing cancer, it would make kids live longer. So that would make it an upper tailed test. Now, if you think about what this is going to do, it actually makes it easier on the researcher to find that you're in that red zone because you've made the red zone bigger. So if you make it bigger, it's easier to land in there. So it, it should feel kind of like cheating. Like the researcher made it easier on themselves. Um, to kind of find you in the red zone. That's why you really don't want to do a one-tailed test unless you have really good reason. And in my eyes, the only thing that justifies really good reason is you have a lot of research that suggests that's where it's going to be. And you're just trying to see if it works for your particular population. So if you don't have a lot of background research, not just one study, but several studies that suggest, oh, it's always going to be on that upper tail or it's always going to be on that lower tail, then you really should make sure that you keep it a two-tailed test. You're always going to keep it 5%, but if it's two-tailed, it's split evenly between the two sides. If it's one-tailed, it's all the way on one side or the other. So now that we kind of established that you could have either one-tailed or two-tailed, I'd like to talk about how the null and alternative hypotheses look with symbols. So, um, we had written them out in words, right? Something like um, my population is different, uh, or sorry, my sample is different from the population. But I want to show you that we can also do this with symbols. So remember when we're writing these that the null hypothesis is shout no difference. If you shout it, maybe your neighbors will wonder what kind of stats class you're taking or something. Um, but we want to keep that in mind while we're writing these. So if I were going to write the null hypothesis, for just a general two-tailed test, the symbols would look something like this. So remember, we denote it as HO, and then this is a mu A equals mu B. So it's like condition A and condition B. Perhaps A is the um, uh, no treatment group and B is the treatment group, right? So we're saying that they're going to be the same. So this another way of wording this would be that um, the treatment group is no different from the, no uh, from the treatment group, right? So if they're equal to, that's also saying no difference. So the null hypothesis here has no difference iterated in that, those symbols. So now that we know that's how the symbols look for the null hypothesis, maybe you can think about what it would look like for the alternative. So hopefully we're thinking, oh, it would be the not equal to sign, and you'd be right. So we're saying that there is a difference in the alternative hypothesis, so mu A is not the same as mu B. So that would be the two hypotheses we would set up if we were doing just a generic two-tailed test and we put it in symbol form. 
All right, so now let's think about a one-tailed test, which we were just talking about. Let's do an upper tail test. So for an upper tail test, you'd see words like increase, improve, have a higher score, those kind of, all those words that would suggest it's on the upper end. So let's first talk about the alternative hypothesis, how that might look. So you think about if you're using these same symbols, what would you write in a symbol that would suggest that A would be, have a higher score than B? So hopefully you kind of visualize this. So the alternative hypothesis would be that mu of A is bigger than the mu of B. So what would be the reverse? We want to do the opposite for the null hypothesis. Now, remember that the null hypothesis is no difference. So here's how it would look for the null hypothesis. The opposite of greater than would be less than, but you can't forget to do the equal to sign. Now, um, some books will just do greater than and less than, and they leave it like that. However, as a researcher, you have to account for all possible outcomes. And so if you leave off that equal to sign, we haven't accounted for the fact that maybe A is exactly the same as B. So what this is saying for the alternative is that we are looking at whether A is greater than B compared to A being less than B or the same. So the null hypothesis always has to have the no difference in it. In the two-tailed test, it has the equal to sign in it. In the one-tailed test, it has the equal to sign in it, and that's what this line is represented as. So this is how it would look symbolically as um, a one-tailed, upper-tailed test. Now remember, with the words, it would be very subtle too. It would just say A is bigger than B, and then the null hypothesis would say A is not bigger than B. And by the way, not bigger than B is also could be phrased as less than or equal to. So that's um, why sometimes it's easier to see it with words and sometimes it's easier to see it with symbols. Okay, now that we mastered the upper tail test, let's see if we can predict what the lower tail test would look like. So these would be words like decrease, um, lower the score, um, reduce your performance, those kinds of words. And then um, kind of, it would be the flip of what we saw with the upper tail. So the alternative would say that a is below B. So the mu of A is below the mu of B. And so then the null would be that the mu of A is greater than or equal to the mu of B. So one of the things I wanted to point out is that notice I used the symbols mu. I didn't just say A versus B. In our hypotheses, we're trying to say if we were to able to measure the whole world, let's say A is a cancer treatment and B is non-cancer treatment. If I were to measure everyone in the world with this cancer, would their average be the same as everyone in the world without cancer treatment? And so even though I didn't look at everyone in the world, my study is purely about the sample. We will be making our conclusions about the population. That's what inferential statistics is. So we have to write our words that involve the population rate and not say something like, is my sample different from that other sample? They always have to say, do cancer patients have a different score than uh, cancer patients without treatment? So these very general statements, because that's what inferential statistics is. I want to think if I'm doing a study, let's say to, I have looked at five women and I'm trying to cure breast cancer. I'm not trying to cure breast cancer for just those five women. So I'm not going to say those five women are cured. I was trying to use those five women to say if all women got the same treatment that I gave these five, they would be the same. So I cured cancer, not just I cured cancer for these five people. Those are the kinds of conclusions we're trying to make. The other thing I want to point out is let's say we weren't looking at a group of people versus another group of people, but we were looking at one person. Let's say Bob. This is how it would look if I were writing a two-tailed test for Bob. Now, notice I can't say the mu of Bob because Bob doesn't really have a mu. Mu would suggest an average across several scores, and Bob just has his one score. So if you were writing it with symbols for one person, it would just be, does Bob equal mu? Now, you don't have to say A or B because there's really only one mu in this story. It's Bob versus the population. Up here, it was population A versus population B, population treatment versus population non-treatment. But here, we're just looking at whether Bob is different from the, um, the average. So just Bob equal to mu and Bob not equal to mu. 
So all of this picture is, if you were going to write your null and alternative hypotheses in symbols, it was a reminder that we were going to be using mu, and we're pitting A against B or Bob against the population, and the symbols change depending on whether it's two-tailed or one-tailed.